Okay, well, um, I'll take the next 15 minutes trying to run you through um, a, an Israeli program which actually <coughs> comes from a, a slightly different angle. Uh, it's going to be the experience of uh, implementing a personalized medicine program within an HMO-like organization, a non-for-profit organization. Um, okay, let's go for here. Okay, so just a just couple minutes on, on the Israeli health system. Uh, we are, uh, the, it's, it's again uh, uh, like what we heard before in Belgium or we know from the UK and other, Canada and others. It's a um, health system where uh, there's full coverage of the whole Israeli population, only that the service here is provided by four <coughs> providers, say HMO-like, they're non-for-profit, and uh, the people in the country have the freedom to move between the providers every three or six months. Uh, and uh, actually, the providers only compete on uh, a level of service and you know, long length of lines, of waiting lines, and things like that, because the, the content of the services provided is dictated by the government, and it's fixed for all the HMOs. Okay, so once every year there's a process that updates the services basket but, and says what will be included and what not. But once it's included, all four providers provide the same service on the same items and everything is free of charge or with a very tiny uh, copay. So uh, we, we have four services and I'm going to talk today about the program of Clalit, which is the largest one covering about uh, uh, close to 60% of the population uh, and uh, with about a thousand primary care clinics, um, about uh, 3,200 primary care physicians, seven general hospitals that belong to Clalit, but the, the insurees of Clalit can go into any other hospital in the country. So these are just hospitals that are specifically belong to the organization. Uh, in, uh, in a sense, at least for the Americans, it's a, it's a Kaiser Permanente type of, uh, of organization size-wise, and, uh, and, uh, but, but it's not for profit. Okay, so, so and, and the interesting thing is that we all pay our health insurance to the government. We do not pay to the provider. There's no financial contract between us and the provider, and the government disperses the funding between uh, the different providers according to various parameters, okay? Um, now, uh, when the, when the uh, organization, that CLALIT, I mean that organization, HMO, whatever we call it, uh, decided to move on uh, towards the subject of genomic medicine, personalized medicine, whatever name we give it, uh, they approached us. We were then active as the National Cancer control center of the organization of the HMO, and we had a large team, a disciplinary uh, a team of uh, a variety of uh, professions. Uh, we had a, uh, quite a large lab. Uh, we, had, uh, we were involved in a lot of research uh, with tens of thousands of participants. We had a biobank of more than 400,000 samples, uh, of a variety of samples. And uh, we had experience with a lot of uh, genetic testing, research-based genetic testing. So it made sense to come to us as an expert group and, and suggest that we try and develop a program for, for the HMO uh, on, on these grounds. We also have the, the clinical counseling service, and we have very large series of carriers. Some of them are a reflection of the fact that the Israeli, especially the Ashkenazi population, is a founder population, so you get a lot of mutations, and uh, uh, a, so, so you really reach uh, very large numbers. So in, in, as a whole, we were a facility that was right in place with a lot of hands-on experience uh, in, in, in the genetic aspects of research and large-scale research, so uh, we were approached. Um, I just want to show that within our study, that's one of our studies, our colorectal cancer study, and that's the first 5,000 
participants in the study, etc. We, we were in a stage uh, at that when, when we started designing things, we were at stage of, of really separating populations very clearly and very dramatically within Israel. You see the Ashkenazi uh, population here in black. You see the Sephardi population in red. Uh, these are the Jewish populations. You see the Arab population in blue. In light blue is an Arab sect that are the Druze. Uh, it's interesting, we, we got an influx of non-Arab uh, uh, Christians who are non-Arab. We have Arab Christians. And non-Arab Christians that came in, especially from the Russian republics, in recent years, and you see they're here in green in between. So it's very interesting to see the separation. Uh, um, uh, a paper that showed uh, similar data came out from Duke, uh, who is it, David Ginsburg, right? Uh, Goldstein. Uh, sorry, 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 Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> I'm allowed to do that mistake, you know, see. <laughs> in, any, in any case, David Goldstein, uh, that's a paper that he did, and he again could separate very, very clearly the Jewish population here from the Druze population, Palestinian population, and, and Bedouin population, and here's like the U.S. population. So, so uh, population is separable if we were talking about population certification and need to know the, geno the genetics of certain populations where you operate your medical system. This is clearly a case where, where it shows that uh, you need to uh, have a lot of information about that. Uh, 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 our colleague from Kuwait uh, talked before about uh, Arab populations. We actually have tons of data on, on the genetics of various Arab populations just because we're doing all, uh, most of our studies in northern Israel and that's where most of the Israeli Arab population resides. So a lot of genetics, a lot of non-genetics data on that that could be of help to, to, to groups. Uh, uh, family history was mentioned, mentioned before. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis in trying to introduce family history into our medical records. Uh, uh, every activity that we do on a national level, we try to collect data on that. So, for example, here you see the results, the reporting of the family history of breast cancer among Jews, Christian Arabs, Muslim Arabs, Druze, uh, in women who came in to have a mammogram. <laughs> okay, so these are the reports of a million women, okay, in a, a tiny country. We only have four, mi four million women in the whole country. So a million women reported on family history. The same thing with every screening activity. Everything we do, we make sure to, inco to incorporate family history data into our databases. Not only that, we push it into the doctor's computers, and all the doctors are computerized on the same system. So we push it in, and the next step that we took only recently was we identified first-degree family relatives through the population registered and pushed the day information of family history into their medical records without disclosing who the family case is because then you run into all this, uh, all, the, all the privacy issues. But we pushed, uh, we really are trying to push this data wherever we can and, and we have registers on many other diseases. We also run large registers of uh, cardiovascular diseases and others so we can really push in a, a lot of information this way. In any case, so we set up to, 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 uh, to build a program, an organized program, really a committed organized program, and, and uh, there were issues of policy, of education, and of provision of service. And in policy, first thing was to get the commitment of the management. That's always the toughest part. Uh, you always talk in, in words of cost effectiveness. And in, when you compete only on quality of care, because there's no, you know, uh, there's no other co comp grounds for competition uh, uh, in our system. You want to be innovative. You, be to, you want to show up as a modern service. You want—I mean—all these women, uh, all these words, uh, kind of uh, uh, excite the CEO. Okay, so so this is what you come and sell. You try to say that uh, you'll provide better health and you'll be cost-effective. Uh, uh, the the contents were defined as dealing with mole molecular medicine. To, for risk reduction, for disease detection, for uh, 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 efficient treatment, and for uh, prognosis determination. Uh, finances are always a big issue. Uh, these are, you know, all these technologies are very uh, uh, costly, and also the fact uh, that they uh, are outdated before they actually hit your bench. 
uh, is also a major, major issue. We had to struggle with issues of uh, homebrew testing versus commercial kits. We decided to go for homebrew testing wherever we could. Uh, for example, just because, you know, uh, uh, a founder mutation panel for Ashkenazi Jews in the U.S. would be five to seven hundred dollars. Uh, in our lab, it's about forty dollars, and I've done about fifty thousand of them. So, I mean, so wherever we can, but when you do homebrew, you have to invest in R&D, because otherwise you cannot rely on the development of a kit of others. A lot of legal and ethical issues. Uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, entry into databases, and everything is computerized in our system. It's a big issue. Education, we invested a lot in education of the medical teams. Uh, uh, we are aware of the fact that they are scared, terribly scared by this whole field, and, and many times confused. This is an uh, illegible language for you, but that's like our KRAS brochure, which tells the doctors, and it's actually aimed at the primary care level, to say, you know, what, what is the disease we're talking about, what drugs will be influenced by it, the gene, what test are we going to do, what's a gene test interaction, what's the population uh, uh, variability in the gene, uh, what is the clinical evidence, who should be tested, and what should you do with the answer of the test. Okay, so this is kind of a, uh, and we have it for, for, for numerous, many, many different tests. Uh, provision of service, we, decide, we, the, uh, we established an, a, an expert team of geneticists and pharmacogeneticists and pharmacologists and a variety of physicians uh, who are at the service of all the doctors of the organization. They want to ask somebody, they have a phone call, they can ask about whether to t order the test, what to do with the test result, what the test is about, and everything they want. So there's a support group, and there's a centralized lab as much as we can. We're not limiting it to the centralized lab, but the centralized lab takes most of the toll uh, and uh, does most of the tests. I'll skip these uh, long lists of genes that we are able to do. This is one panel that we gave in and we're starting to operate now, the TrueSec on our MySec. And uh, just as an, and as, a, as an example, uh, doing EGFR uh, testing in lung cancer tissue, uh, we could report close to 2,000 tests within uh, about a year of activity because we, as a centralized lab, get the samples from all the hospitals in Israel. Uh, we can say how many were positive. We can say what is the distribution of the mutations just by being centralized and being with good databases. We just have all the data right there. We can look at, similarly at ALK, which follows uh, a negative EGFR, and again, see the proportion in our population that are positive. Uh, we can see if we want to look at the whole picture of lung cancer, that 33% will be EGFR mutated, 25 KRAS, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, I mean, this is critical data for our, uh, for our decision making with regards to treatment. We can look at multiple mutations in a tumor, okay, to see what's mutually exclusive and what's not. Uh, we can look at survival patterns. Here are the people with EGFR mutations and, uh, 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 and without EGFR mutations. So the EGFR mutate are doing better, but are they doing better because of treatment or are they doing better just because the mutation gives them an advantage. Well, no, if you, if you have the mutation but you're not treated, you're in blue, you're like without the mutation. So the advantage is really only if you are mutated and you, get, and you receive the TKIs uh, to treat uh, the mutation. Similarly, with, uh, with ALK, we could show the differences. And here, if you have ALK mutation, you're really faring uh, badly. We, we were even able, because we have all the pharmacy data, everything is computerized, every single element in the system. So we could actually look, if you had an ALK mutation, but you wrongly received TKIs, what would happen? And also, if you did not have the ALK mutation and you received cosatinib, what would happen? And we can see that it's actually of no value. I mean, so, so it's true that cosatinib should be reserved only for TKI. Uh, for 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 ALK mutated, and that TKIs should be reserved only for EGFR mutated. You know, you can show it with with rather big numbers of uh, information. So I mean, just to conclude, I mean, it's a centralized program, and we think that the centralized uh, centralized program is a good approach. Is this, whoops, already. <laughs>
I think I still have a second. <laughs> okay, can you bring it back? Okay, anyway, uh, uh, we, <laughs> we think that a centralized program has, has its advantages, and uh, uh, by having big volumes, uh, you can really uh, make sure that you have very good high uh, quality control uh, uh, for your tests. You can uh, make sure that your turnaround of, the, of, the, of response, of results, will be fast and quick. Uh, and you have tons of data that actually come to a central database where you can control and see the stuff. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the team. Uh, you are not going to see the picture of all the team members. But in any case, uh, this is just an example of how to try and, in a very organized manner, take something from A to B and uh, under the responsibility of the organization. So this is really covering a whole population. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Relling, St. Jude. So you showed the incredible uh, ancestral diversity that you have in your population related to um, race and ethnic groups. Do you have any examples of a variant that's actionable in one group and not actionable in another, either somatically acquired or inherited? No. Dan so I have this. so I have all these specific. I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> that's my, that's trying. <laughs> no, that's okay. Okay, 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 okay. Dr. Rose. No, I mean because 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 you're asking whether it's actionable or not, and you're referring to the result of the of the action to show that something worked in this group and did not, although the two groups had the same mutation. Right. I mean, oh. I think there's a lot uh, of examples of things that are that's a different very actionable. Question. They have a functional. Right. Or non-existent. So, for yeah. example, that, that's a different situation, yeah, but the no, but that's very, very surprising to us that we we have, you know, within the Jewish uh, population, you know, we could find the 185 DLAG, whatever BRCA, yeah. in Ashkenazi Jews, also in Iraqi Jews, yeah. which are completely a different area, but in none of the North African Jews. Right, that's so, the, that then you don't know, you need to right. someone's ancestry in order to interpret the truth both right. by Yeah. Does it really affect the way that we give advice to patients and ask them these sorts of things? Not before we test it. So I have a very specific question about a, a germline variant, uh, and that's the D36Y variant in vcor C1. D, so the one question in, was in, in, in vcor C1, so the warfarin okay. gene. Okay. So that one, of the question, one of the questions I actually had was whether you have a, a focus only on the tumor genome or whether there's a... Uh, 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 we've done we've germline done. as well. No, no, we, we, we're definitely doing germline testing too. Uh, I've done thousands of vcor C1 as part of a study, you know, I mean, research based, because again, we, we are constantly involved in R&D. We have to, because we have to, if this comes up to be an important gene, we have to be ready to supply so the there, service nationwide. There, there are data, there are Israeli data that On suggests that there's a five yeah. four, there's a, okay. a five percent or a rare, a rare non-synonymous non-synonymous variant in vcor C1 that confers okay. relative or absolute warfarin resistance. So these patients take instead of taking five milligrams a day, take fifteen milligrams okay. a day. And I'm just wondering whether you have encountered that one and whether that uh, is an implementable. We probably uh, did not encounter it. I mean specific in our lab because otherwise I would have known about it. But I do know that we tested for the whole, you know, cardiovascular panel, including, uh, CIP, you know. So the, 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 the cardiovascular and panels and have to include this one. For, I, I would have thought they have to include this one because this is an Ashkenazi variant. Wait, um, okay, sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I'm just, <laughs> I, you know, you're, you're the one who delivers the services, not me. So uh, uh, I, hope, I was hoping that that was going to be an answer to Mary's question. Yeah. A variant that is ancestry specific and actionable, but maybe I'm not. No, that, maybe I maybe I don't know enough about it. That's not her. Her question was, if I can find it in uh, one ethnic group, in two ethnic groups, but it's actionable in one and not oh. in the other. That is a tricky one, because I mean, finding it in. You're right. That 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dan was wrong. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to ask you about the, the data that you showed on crisotinib not being effective in, in EGRF negatives, which is what one would expect. You would think that those would be unimportant data, but actually in talking with our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, one of the things that they find is that physicians will do these tests and will give the drug anyway, even if it's negative. You may have the same thing happen in your place yeah. because it's the best choice. You, you see, you, that's why it happened. I mean, how would it how would you otherwise have it? It should be sequential. Right. You have the mutation, you're, you're, you're eligible for the drug. Correct. Now, many patients elect to use the drug privately anyway. or whatever, and, and that's, what, that's how we can show. I mean, otherwise, I would not have had anybody who I exactly. was not and did the so, so what I wanted to say was, was you know, A, we, we need to get phys physicians to actually follow up and act based on the tests that they do, but that's one, one issue. Another is that it's very helpful to have that kind of evidence because our, actually some of the ways that our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, makes decisions on payment is not necessarily on having evidence of benefit, but just having some influence on medical care. So it doesn't necessarily have to have an evidence. It's being written up. Great, it's great, okay. Yeah, so, so, and, yeah, and so just letting, letting others know that, that those kinds of data are very helpful, and they said, if you have any evidence that things don't work, we want to know that, so, so that would be great. Um, maybe I'll ask the, or make the last comment. Um, uh, what, what I heard you describe was um, an incredibly powerful system for evidence generation. You, you, you describe it as a, a, a centralized means of providing quality service provision, but you've got the genomic data, the pharmacy data, the outcome data, and because you're an HMO, you have obviously the cost data. So to me, this would seem like the perfect system to do what is thematic in this meeting to really begin to generate evidence at scale. Do you want to comment on that, or do you, do you disagree? Or, and then yeah, I, well, why I haven't disagree for, for a statement on a per perfect system, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But no, it, it, it is very powerful, I have to admit. It's very powerful, and actually a lot of different agencies are making use of our data. Like now we are happy to have the FDA ask us questions about dr certain drugs, not the genomics of drugs, but like, you know, side effects and stuff like that. Whenever the issues come up, we can imme immediately, you know, uh, query our databases. And these are immense databases. I mean, they're billions of points of entry. So it's actually quite hard to, to, to handle. But yes, I mean, it's special. The only, <laughs> the only thing that worries me a little bit when we do our work is to what extent is it, is it uh, generalizable. That's the only issue. I mean, if we are really genetically uh, different, to what extent is, it, is that the case? And because it's, it's, it's really, I mean, I, I, uh, naturally, I don't have the time to show a million examples. But you know, I mean, like, we have half the lung cancer rate per same smoking than uh, uh, non-Jews. Now it's true in Israel and it's true in New York. If you if you compare New York uh, uh, Jews and non-Jews in New York, and studies with 10, 15,000 participants, big studies, and uh, you know with with all the effort to find the genetics of that, including whole genome, uh, you know, not whole genome. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, whole, whole genome sequencing and everything. We, we can't put our finger on what's happening. Okay, so there's a lot of issues. And the question is really to what extent uh, is it uh, generalizable? You know, should some, uh, and there are many issues, you know, I mean like BRCA genes, very common in our system. Uh, does anybody know why, if, if the penetrance is 50%, why do two women with the same mutation one gets the chance and one does not. I mean, 100 women, 50 get it, 50 do not. Why? So I mean, Simba, the Simba Consortium is trying to answer this question for 10 years. No answer. So, so your mention of the, of the BRCA gene makes me channel Heidi again um, and, and just raise the, the issue of, of it's been very difficult in the U.S. to get data on sequence variation in BRCA1 because all the data are locked up in a proprietary database. Um, but there are efforts to try to either, you know, liberalize or, or liberate some of those data or report them individually. But are you guys working on, on BRCA1 sequence variants, depositing them somewhere, making them available with phenotype information? Because it would be critically important, I think. Uh, I, frankly, the answer is no, and it's no because we are so spoiled. We have the founder mutations. We don't need to look at variants. Oh, we just go directly for the, for the, for the founders, so we don't sequence. We're going to start sequencing now because we have enough reason to do it. 
but but actually yeah, when you <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah yeah although we have tons of variants and yeah. other things that you can correlate the you know uh, lynchings and things 